I don't know. That's a good question. That's a weird question to ask. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> forgot to record, so I'm just starting this a little bit late. Um, pause where you need to on the uh, homework key. There's seven, eight, nine. There's ten. And I think we're here. Anybody still need ten? No, that's an interesting set. Okay, and then here's eleven. I wonder if anybody raised, raised their hand as they were watching this. What if anybody watching? <laughs> I know, but like, just, just like muscle memory. Does anybody need more than that? You know what is really awkward, though? Like, when you go out to eat, or like, when, when you oh, I go out to eat, time. like, they put their food, put food down, and they're like, okay, enjoy your meal, and you're like, you too. You too. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I did it once Saturday, and I did it like three different times. Like they said three so different awkward. things. They're like, oh, I do yeah, it every single time. Like, so I said that to somebody like uh, taking like the, the boarding pass at the time of the plane. Like, enjoy your flight. You too. <laughs> I didn't. You're not going on flight. 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 Next page, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then um, I wouldn't worry too much about 22. We're going to talk about um, compound interest a lot a little bit later on. Uh, this is just to kind of get you in, uh, use, or kind of introduce it to you. Um, that's a, that is our compound interest formula. We'll look at that a little bit later on. Uh, the principal times 1 plus r over n to the nt power. Basically, that's saying it's how many times it's compounding in a, in a year or um, you know, it looks like this one is compounded quarterly, so it's kept being compounded four times in a year. That basically just means how much, like, when do I actually take the interest? When do I actually evaluate what's in the account and then compound the interest based on the the um, the, the amount in the account? I'll call it. Um, so it happens four times a year. That's why it's compounding uh, quarterly there. So it's you, you take your five percent. Divide it by four and raise it to the twentieth power because it's four times five. Uh, we see twenty-three over there, and then there is part C for twenty-two. I promise. I know I got long-winded yesterday, but um, today's today's lesson is is pretty short. Um, so I'm guessing we're going to have some time in class to work on our homework, but again, who knows? I just get excited about math, and I just talk a little bit longer than I probably should. I'm sorry. I really apologize. Yeah. That, that right there. Like, that's the weird thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the weird sorry thing. I'm sorry for just being I so excited about math. I promise you appreciate it when you, when you explain it. Okay, so uh, any questions on the homework? Okay, this section uh, that we got coming up here, section seven and two. Um, you know, I was talking about this with Mr. Hudson. This is a kind of a weird section in that this could come at really any point in the year. This one particular section. This isn't really tied into anything with exponents or log or sorry, or logarithms. Okay, it's kind of like its own separate little thing. But you need to know how to do it to do the next section. So that it's kind of like. Oh, this is the last chance we can do this call, this section, so we might as well do it now. Um, inverses and relations uh, and functions. Inverses of relations and functions. Now, um, we've seen the word inverse used in a lot of different ways. We talked about it at the very beginning of the year in terms of additive and multiplicative inverse. I remember the additive inverse is just a... Um, the opposite of that number. So if I've got the additive inverse of three, it would be negative three. If I've got the additive inverse of seven, it would be negative seven. If I've got the additive inverse of negative ten, it would be positive ten, right? It's the opposite. Um, multiplicative inverse is the reciprocal of that value. So if it's multiplicative inverse of five would be one fifth. Multiplicative inverse of three would be one third. Multiplicative inverse of two thirds would be three halves. And we talked about multiplicative inverse of matrices. Now we didn't actually compute those by hand. But we did talk about them in, turn, in like putting them into our calculator and seeing what happened with them. Now, just as we can, we have inverses of 
uh, numbers and matrices and things like that, we can actually find inverses of functions as well. Uh, to graph an inverse re uh, relation, you know, uh, remember the distinction between relation and function is that the function passes the rest of the line test. So I'm going to be using that term a little loosely. Um, just know that whenever I say a function, I'm saying, okay, some sort of equation, some sort of relation. You can, you, you can also find and apply inverses to relations and functions. The graph, to graph the inverse relation, you can reflect each point across the line y equals x. That's a really important piece of information right there. You can reflect each point across the line y equals x. That's really important to graph an inverse. You can always just reflect, the, reflect each point across the line y equals x. Okay, where is the line y equals x? Remember that the line y equals x is just basically a diagonal line running through the coordinate plane, right? If there's a simple coordinate plane right there, here is the line y equals x. Right? So if I reflect across that line, that's actually going to give me the inverse of that relation. Every x value is becoming a y value. Every y value, y value is becoming an x value. It's flipping everything. Okay. So take a look at this table here. Graph the relation, connect the points, and graph the inverse. Um, so all I'm going to do is just graph these set of points, make a new table for my inverse, and then regraph to see what happens in terms of on the xy plane. So I've got 0, 2, 1, 5, 5, 6, and 8, 9. Let's plot these points real quick. You can do this with me. 0, 2, 1, 5, 5, 6, 8, 9. Uh, and then, um, you know what, it just, is it the same as a function? Well, I guess, would we normally connect our dots if I was just given this table? No, I'm going to kind of break that rule so that we can clearly see the inverse, though. Okay. I know we wouldn't connect our dots, but I'd really like us to see what's happening in terms of the inverse, so let's, let's just connect our dots. Let's be rule breakers today, folks. Come on, let's do it. Yay. Let's go crazy. Let's connect those dots. <laughs> All right. Now this is going to be the, this is going to be the inverse over here. Okay. Basically, that means all x values are going to become y values, or y values are going to become x values. So now my new x's are going to be. 2, 5, 6, and 9, my, dom my range becomes my domain, and my domain becomes my range, 0, 1, 5, and 8. Okay, that's my inverse. All x's become y values, all y values become x values. So instead of the coordinate 1, 5, we have the coordinate 5, 1. Instead of the coordinate 0, 2, we have 2, 0. Five, now let's regraph 5, 1. 6, 5, 9, 8. All right. Now, what, did, what do I want to show you here? Well, take a look at the line y equals x. Let's put in a dotted line here of the line y equals x. Well, it goes diagonally through the center of the first quadrant. Aren't those true reflections over that line y equals x? Okay. So what, what's, what are we getting at here? What's the point of this? Is that we're going to be doing a lot of different inverse relationships. We're going to take inverse of exponentials. We're going to take inverse of quadratics. We're going to take inverse of all different types of functions. Okay, we're not going to be just limited to exponentials like we're talking about in this chapter. We could take inverses of anything that we wanted. But here's the deal. When we go to graph them, it should always be a reflection of the line y equals x. If it's not, then you've done something wrong. This is a good, easy way to check to see, okay, is this truly the inverse of that function? Well, graph it. Is it a true reflection of the line y equals x? If it's not, then you've done something wrong. Okay, this is a, a, a reflection of the line y equals x. All right, now, um, that's how to do it if it was a stable of values. Where the, where the relation is also a function, you can use this 
special type of notation. Um, you notice how we had function notation being the f of x. You can put this f inverse of x, and that's how we would read that. f inverse of x. F, please note that that's not like one like negative exponent type thing. Um, that is what read f inverse of x. It has no relation to um, you know a negative exponent. Uh, F inverse of x notation. So whenever you see that symbol with the negative one up in the, uh, I don't want to call it an exponent, but up there, um, that's that's an inverse. That's denoting that it that's the function's inverse. Okay. Yeah, that does not indicate a reciprocal. That is not going to like put it into a fraction or anything like that. Functions that undo each other are called inverse functions. Now, thinking about it basically, is that you know take a look at these two functions, x plus six and x minus six. They look like inverses, right? x plus 6, x minus 6. Yeah, I bet they undo each other. If I add 6 to something, and then I take 6 away, that's going to undo whatever I did, right? Now, take a, take a look and see here what happens with my input and output. My input of, the, of f of x is 3, and my output, 3 plus 6, is 9. Now, a true inverse function will take the output and bring it back to the input. Meaning, if I put that 9 back into f inverse, if I run it through f and then take that output and run it back in through f inverse, then it should give me back to the original input. Okay? It should undo each other. That's what inverses do. They undo whatever operation that had been, had been happening to it. Okay? We can see it very plainly here because this is just a plus 6 minus 6. When it gets a little bit more difficult is when the when the um, the functions get a little bit more complicated. Uh, to find the inverse function, you use the inverse operations. In this example above, six is added to x in f of x, so six is subtracted to f inverse of x. Very simple, right? Now, how do we do that when it's a little bit more complicated? Here we go. Uh, ooh, Yeah, there we go. Get you out of the way. <laughs> so we have f of x is equal to x minus one half. Okay. Now, if I've got x minus one half, what do you think the inverse is going to be? X plus one half. X plus one half. And just do the inverse operation. Let's let's really see though. Now, how do we check? How do we algebraically see that f inverse of x is indeed x plus one half? Well, what did we do with the coordinates? We swapped x and y, right? You do the exact same thing with the equations. You can find the inverse function by writing the original function with x and y switched, then resolving for y. Here's what I mean here. f of x looked like this. y is equal to x minus 1 half, right? f of x is the same thing as y. To find the inverse, I swap x and y. And then I just resolve for y. Add the one half over to the other side. That's the inverse. And isn't it what we guessed what was going to happen? Okay, so all we need to do is flip x and y, replace x with y, and then resolve. Now, this is another very simple one. If I've got x divided by 3, what do you think the inverse is? Well, what's the inverse operation of division? Multiplication. So instead of dividing by 3, it's probably multiplying by 3. Let's, let's see. You know, we guessed that f inverse of x is going to be 3 times x, or x times 3, right? Let's see if that's actually the case. Okay, the old was y is equal to x over 3. The new, the inverse, x is equal to y over 3. And how do we get y completely alone? We multiply 3 over to the other side. 3x 
is equal to y, or f inverse is equal to 3x. All right, so those were basic examples. Now, this one's not as easy to see right off the bat, right? I don't know what inverse operations are going to come first, second, what, I don't know what to do here. So let's just go straight to solving this algebraically. The old was y is equal to 3 quantity x minus 7. The new, x is equal to 3 quantity y minus 7. And now we just resolve for y. Let's multiply by 3 into this here. x is equal to 3y minus 21. Add the 21 over to the other side. x plus 21 is equal to 3y. And then I divide by 3, and I like to divide by 3 to all parts. So I've got x over 3 plus 7 is equal to y. So in other words, make sure you put it in inverse notation. f inverse of x is equal to x over 3 plus 7. How could you be very sure that these were indeed inverses? Graph them. Graph them. Go ahead and, you don't have to do it right now, you would go ahead and put it in your calculator and see that they are true reflections of the line y equals x. All right. Graph f of x, write the inverse, then we'll graph again. Okay. Again, this is like that thing where I, I should be able to see that this is a reflection of the line y equals x. Okay, so the old function is f of x is equal to negative one-half x minus five. So here, y is equal to negative one-half x minus five. I replace f of x with y. And now I swap. x is equal to negative one-half y minus five. And I re-solve for y. I add the five over to the other side. x plus five is equal to negative one-half y. And then I multiply, I would divide by negative one half, right? But dividing by one half is like multiplying by two, right? So I'm going to multiply by negative two over to the other side. Let's see, times negative two. The whole side times negative two, that's going to give me negative two. X minus 10 is equal to Y. So my inverse, F inverse of X is equal to negative 2x minus 10. Now let's graph and see if that actually is the case. Remember, I should see a reflection over the line y equals x. That was a very poor line there. I want to, I think I'm going to highlight it. Automatically goes straight on a highlight it. Yeah, there we go. That's okay. All right, so let's graph this. I'm going to put the first one in red. Negative 1 half x minus 5. Okay, y intercept of negative 5. The slope of negative 1 half, down 1 right 2, or up 1 left 2. So here's my line. There's f. And now let's graph f inverse. Negative 2x minus 10. Oh, really? 7, 8, 9, 10. Sure. Now the slope is negative 2. Uh, rise to left one. There we go. Rise to left one. 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 There is f inverse. Do they look like reflections over the line y equals x? They do to me. Okay, this piece gets flopped over here. This piece gets flopped over there. Make sure you do all parts to this, right? I want to write the inverse and then graph. Graph the original, write the inverse, and graph the original. Make sure that it's a reflection of the line y equals x. Again, how would we do this? Just to show it in the calculator, just so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, if I go into my y equals, and I say negative 0.5x minus 5, and then I go y2, negative 2x minus 10. Zoom six. Yeah, there's there's my line. Now this is kind of weird. It looks 
I, I, I wouldn't always trust the visual part of your calculator just because is my screen square? No, my screen is rectangular. So the X values are going to always look more spaced out than the Y values. So to see true reflections like that one's not always react to it's a little weird. Um, but you can always check it to make sure. Yeah. You know, think about it this way. If you want to just plot the line Y equals X as well, you know, ooh, let's get let's get crazy, folks, and let's make it a dotted line. You can change the color, you know, change the shading. I can't change color on this, but you know what I mean. Yeah, let me see that. Oh, it didn't make it down. <laughs> I went through all of that. I know, it went really fast. <laughs> okay. Someone, someone had their coffee. Only like two times I was like through webcam. I know. Like, the like, like, huh? um, okay, now, in a real world situation, does it make sense to actually switch the variables? So, like, it's, it's very important to think about inverses in terms of real life situations. But does it actually make sense to switch variables when you're talking about when when things mean something? Not necessarily. So while it's good to do algebraically, to find the inverse of a, of a relation in terms of real life application, well, you don't swap the variables, you just solve for the other one. Like for example here, uh, Juan buys a CD online for 20% off the, uh, the list price. He has to pay $2.50 for shipping. The total charge is $13.70. What is the list price of the CD? So I would think about it like this. Okay, $13.70 is the total, right? $13.70 is the total. One buys a CD for 20% off the list price. Okay, um, it's 20% off the list price, right? Uh, you know what, let's... Let's say this. Let's not think about our 1370. Let's let's say T for total. Sorry, I keep changing my mind. Uh, let's say T for total. There you go. I know, really. Hey, don't offend me. Okay. Juan buys a CD for 20% off the list price. Okay, if it's 20% off the list price, how much of the list price is he actually paying? 80%. So it's 80%, 0 0.8 times uh, list price. Let's go L. But he has to pay an additional $2.50 for shipping. See, I've got an equation here where L really means something and T really means something. So it wouldn't make sense to swap T and L and resolve. But what I can do is solve for the other variable. And when I solve for the other variable, it will create for me a different equation. Like for example here, let's solve for L. Let's get L completely alone. That means subtract the 250. So 0 0.8L is equal to T minus 2.5. And then I divide by 0.8. See, this is an equation it gets me with a shipping cost of two dollars and fifty cents, and an eighty and a twenty percent discount. That'll give me the list price of whatever it was going to be if I know the final price. Okay, so now I can say, well, because these two these two functions are indeed inverses of one another. You know, if I Talk about this first function here in red and then the blue function down below. Those are truly inverses of one another. They will undo each other. Now, um, let's plug in. It says the total charge is $13.70. So the list price is going to be 13.7 minus 2.5, all divided by 0 0.8. See what that comes out to be. 13.7 minus 2.5 divided by 0 0.8. $14. Now, did it, would it make sense to do this like whole long process just for this one example? Might not, because this is just one little, you know, piece of information there. You know, this is one little scenario. However, 
if you had like a lot of data, a lot of data on a certain topic and a certain like experiment or something, and you wanted to find the inverses of a lot of things, it might be better to create the equation so that it's easier to run. You know? Okay. All right. Um, I'll shut up now, and you guys can get to work on your homework. Does that sound good?